Welcome everyone um, to the National Science Policy Network's Diplomacy Training and Cultural Competency for the Workplace and the World. If you are new to NSPN, NSPN is an organization built for and geared for early career STEM professionals who want to engage and train in science diplomacy, advocacy, and policy. So if you're here today and you're interested, please connect with us. And uh, if you're curious to learn more, please reach out um, and we're happy to tell you about NSPN or today's event. For today, um, it was cur curated by a team of NSPN members and leaders, uh, two of which will be today's moderators. I'm Anastasia Burnett and I'll be moderating with Lauren Wagner, the vice chair to the Science Diplomacy Committee. And the goal of this webinar is to introduce the framework of cultural competency in its current climate at institutional workplaces and then share in-house practical organizational skills to apply in cross-cultural workplaces. And so today we'll be joined by Dr. Yolanda Moses, who will deliver a keynote address on cultural competency and Vishwa Bhatt, who will open up a discussion and share her skills on cultural competency. So I'm excited for this event because institutions like health centers, universities and companies are evaluating and reevaluating their core values in response to cultural shifts in the workplace and beyond. And so we really hope to critically and interactively lean into cultural competency as a framework and action today. And so we encourage audience questions following the keynote address and during the discussion session. And so with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. For our keynote address, we have Dr. Yolanda T. Moses, who is the Professor of Anthropology and co-PI on an NIH-funded grant to establish a health disparities research center at the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Moses' research focuses on the broad question of the origins of social inequality in complex societies. She has explored gender and class disparities in the Caribbean and East Africa, and more recently, her research has focused on issues of diversity and change in universities and colleges in the United States, India, South Africa, and Australia. She has led a multi-sponsored national public education project and has served as president of the American Anthropological Association and associate vice chancellor for DEI at UC Riverside. So thank you so much for joining us and we're excited to have you and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited to talk to uh, all of you uh, <clears throat> because you all are the, um, the future of, um, of, of science uh, professionals uh, that are based on research, advocacy, and change. And that's, that's really, really important because as those of us get older, we see the work is not finished. And there uh, should be, there has to be the next generation of folks who are out there uh, being the change that we want to see. So um, I'm going to be talking about cultural competency for the next few minutes. And you've heard my background. So I've had experience um, with diversity and inclusion um, issues for the past, I'd say, 30 years in terms of my work. And it's they've been both in the institutional settings, in universities and colleges, in not-for-profit organizations um, as well. So in terms of my presentation, I want to start with definitions. And that is culture and competence. The idea from anthropology is that culture is the sum total of our learned behavior. And one of the things I find in doing workshops um, and talking with people about culture is that they think about culture as what we would call high culture. That is things like uh, art and music and opera and those kinds of things that we can touch and see and feel. But culture is also about everything that has created who we are and how we got to be where we are today. So it's about our institutions, it's about our experiences, it's all of those things. And then the idea of competence, the ability to do something e uh, efficiently and effectively. Uh, putting those two together, the definition of cultural competency that I use comes from CROSS and that it is an institutional framework and that's key, institutional. 
is an institutional framework that expands an organization's internal and external capacity to support and implement protocols that improve workers' attitudes, cross-cultural communication, staff diversity, and ongoing relationships with multicultural communities and stakeholders. So those are propositions or values that are not just one-offs, and I'll talk about this as we move through, but have to become a part of sustained learning and engagement. So when I use cultural competence, I think of it as in at least three parts. One is um, the acquisition and the development of cultural knowledge, which is ongoing. Cultural attitudes and behaviors, uh, I mean, cultural awareness and attitudes, that is what you know, what you think you know, but what you know. And then what is your engagement with that? That's also uh, very important. And then the third piece is about behavior and skills. And this is where a lot of workshops and what have you focus on that are involved with cultural competence and DEI work is on the behaviors and the skills, but it is all three of those components that are really important if we, if we, you are going to develop that kind of competency. So let's start with cultural knowledge, and cultural knowledge is about understanding the dynamic nature of culture. That is, when you hear people say well, those people do this and those people do that. It's about putting people in boxes and understanding cultural knowledge is about understanding the dynamic and the constant changing nature of culture so that it is something that is ongoing. It's a, like a flowing stream that you step into versus reciting a litany or a or a list of attributes that certain people have. And <clears throat> the other thing about knowledge is it's about uh, understanding the broad versus narrow definitions of knowledge. That is, how are you situated in a situation? How are you situated in an environment? And what are the things that have come to bear on the situation, not just on what the situation is, but how, how did the situation come about and how is the situation you're investigating um, uh, in contextualized? What is that context? So these um, broader dimensions of cultural knowledge put you in a place where you can truly understand what is going on. And that leads to the next point, understanding the local context. It's one thing to say, well, this worked over here or this worked over there, so it must work here too. And that is where the cross-cultural understanding and knowledge comes in because the local context is what is going to give you the information you need to problem solve in that environment. And so one size does not fit all. The thing that often gets left out of um, uh, cultural competence is the importance of understanding systems and systemic inequalities. And if you think about systems, you think that they are mechanisms that have been in place for a long time. Some of them are visible and some of them are invisible. And when they're invisible, they become naturalized. And so part of this understanding systemic inequalities is about understanding how to destabilize systems, how to not make assumptions that I know what it is. It's like a fish, you know, and you say, how is the, how is the water today to a fish? And the fish would say, what water, right? So it's, it's getting that, understanding of the system in that that the the issue is in cultural awareness and attitudes it's it, this is this is a part of 
uh, cultural competency that's about uh, involving yourself. That is, the, the research shows that, you know, we want to learn things about other people. We want to make sure that we get that handshake right or that we pronounce that name right. And it's about, it's about external, but part of cultural awareness and attitudes is about understanding you, who you are, how you're situated, what your assumptions are, what your cultural conditioning has been that perhaps need to be interrogated. And that means a one workshop is not going to do it. That means to do this work, you have to be motivated to do some deep learning about others, about other situations, about history, about politics, about you know all kinds of things that you perhaps thought you were not interested in. Um, and <clears throat> yes, diversity, and this is the last point on this slide, is about respect for cultural differences because it's out of those differences that you can understand where there are also similarities between humans and, and situations and, and knowledge building and sharing of experiences. So it's yes about respect for differences, but it's also using that as a platform to figure out where are our common uh, values and where are ways that we can build coalitions and work together for the kind of change that we want to see. The last <clears throat> part, portion of this is looking at behaviors and skills that you develop to change those behaviors. One of them, of course, is understanding how to communicate cross-culturally, how to, how to not assume that you're all talking about the same thing. And when you give examples, that these are examples that are universal, that people understand what you're talking about. Again, if you're situated in a local context, then you would be able to then have that conversation that is contextualized. Um, and it's a movement from um, me-centered to other person-centered. That is, if you put yourself in that other person's place, how would you think about this? But in order to do that, you would need to understand what that situation is. Because if you don't, then you, your advocacy and your actions may be misplaced, um, misunderstood, um, they may miss the mark, and you may only have one or two opportunities to make the kind of interventions that you may want to make. So building uh, ally skills, that is, I always say, if someone you know, would say to me, what, what is an ally? An ally is not only someone who supports another person and, and, and activities that another person is doing, but even if that person is not in the room, you would be doing that kind of work because you know what that person would say, you know what those values are, and those hopefully would be your values as well. So the kind of training that's going on that's building ally skills, see something, say something, where you're sponsoring, uh, sponsorships, that is, we talk about helping uh, women and girls in, in war-torn countries at our university, and not just um, sending money, but also sponsoring uh, sci uh, scientists and faculty and graduate students and undergraduate students to come to our universities. That is walking our talk and not just saying, oh, we are advocates for you. What are you doing that is going to show that in very concrete ways? Clearly, there's all kinds of uh, literature on mentorship. 
that you can tap into. Uh, and I tap into um, coalition building because, you know, before I became a full-fledged anthropologist, I, as a graduate student, was a troublemaker and a rabble rouser in my university, and I became actually a community organizer. So I bring those skills as well into my uh, work in the university and in my in the education and training programs as well. So uh, those are the components of cultural competency. And so I wanted to talk a, a bit about how is cultural competence developed. It is so important, and I have to say this over and over and over again, leadership is so important. We have learned after 20 years that hiring chief diversity officers is not the way to change institutional culture. It has to start at the top. And the leadership, the people who are in leadership roles have to be the prime movers. They can hand it off to other people, but they have to be the prime movers of this enterprise. Otherwise, it isn't going to be taken seriously by people in the organizational structure below. And this is the kind of work that, that you can you know, have a veneer of competency because you've taken this workshop, this workshop, and this workshop. But for organizational change to take place, there has to be leadership at the top. And that is what leads to change within the organization around these values of cultural competence. That is, what does it take for us to be an organization that believes in cultural competence? Or do we have the capacity as an organization, not just as an individuals to do this work, but what are our policies and what are our practices telling us about our commitment to cultural competency? And do we run into roadblocks and policies that stop that work because our organization has not taken this work seriously? Yes, there is change at the individual level. We can all change ourselves individually, but if the organization is not changing, there's not going to be a, a real commitment to uh, cultural competence that moves the needle the way we want to. And finally, on this slide, one of the things I've seen over the years is you can't have the leadership do everything. They're like the prime movers, right? These models have to be developed with, not for the people in the organizations and leaving out the historically marginalized groups and giving them a program that has been developed after you've gone through all the work to do that is not gonna work either. So it has to, you have to move from models of the expert working for or uh, bringing programs to marginalized groups to having marginalized groups at the table while the work is being done and the project is being put together. And so what are some of the barriers to this work? Um, well, one of the barriers is the fear of the unknown. That is, what happens if I get it wrong? What's going to happen? And I think about, you know, people not wanting to talk about race. And, you know, we did a whole national project about that here in the United States with the American Anthropology Association. I'm not going to say anything for fear. I'll say the wrong thing. And so I'll just be, I won't do anything. I'll, I'll, I'll be immobile. I won't say or do anything. People have to be empowered, and but the environment has to be such that people who make mistakes or say things that, you know, might cause you to cringe are not vilified, but are people who are trying to learn and, and being treated like that. 
there's also a lack of systemic support for cultural competence in the agencies and organizations that I've seen. Again, they give it to one group of people to do, and then everybody else goes on sort of business as usual. It's like, okay, we hired you to do that. So you do it for all of us, and we'll just continue to do things the way we've always done them. Well, that's not going uh, to work either. When I was doing some research for um, this talk to see if there's been you know, anything new, there was a study done on medical doctors who um, were going through a certain kind of DEI training, cultural competence training, and the research found that the doctors felt that they knew what to do because they had a workshop and they had brought in an interpreter into the office to work with them. Therefore, they were trained. And so what the research was showing is that there's truly a lack of formal training. There's all kinds of informal training that goes on around education for cultural competence, but not structured formal programs that are ongoing. There's also the research shows that there's still a lack of self-reflexivity. That is, uh, yes, I've, I, I know what to do. I've read this book, I've taken this workshop and, and I, that's all I'm going to do because that's all I have time for. And uh, I think I'm good. I'm good, thanks. I don't want to do anything else. So there's still that lack of reflex, self-reflexivity to give yourself over to the time that it takes to understand what you're bringing to the table and what you still need to know in order to be effective in terms of the leadership roles that you want to play in, in your environment. There's also uh, still a lack of organizational diversity. That is, oftentimes the marginalized groups are at the bottom and the leadership group is made up of people who, uh, who look different from that group. And there still needs to be more thinking about uh, diversity at all levels of the organizational structure, not just at the, at the uh, entry levels, but at all levels. That is, how do you create programs to move people through the organizational structure? I have found, and the research uh, complements this, that there is a, there's a lack of accountability for how do you know you're doing a good job? And if you're not doing a good job around cultural competency, what's the uh, what's the consequence of that? Where are the or where are the accountability measures that you're doing a good job? Is it related to your your evaluations? Is it related to your um, excuse me ability to get work, uh, to, to get promoted? What are, where are the accountability measures in this? It's too much left at this point to individuals to decide how they want to engage in cultural competence. And this is again where the leadership is important. I'll give you an example. When I was the uh, vice chancellor for DEI at the University of California, Riverside, we had um, a goal to bring in more diverse faculty in the university. And it was a three or four year project. At the end of those three or four years, there was no way for us to, to really tell who had done a good job and who hadn't, who had tried and who hadn't. Because along the way, the, pro, the provost and the chancellor had not built into that plan ways of measuring along the way. They had just assumed everybody was doing a good job. And I knew for a fact that everybody wasn't doing a good job because that was my job to know that. But there was no accountability in the system. There's some additional takes on 
uh, cultural competence. This has been a concept that's been around at least 20, maybe 25 years. And people who've been doing research around this are now talking about cultural humility, that, that, that we, in addition to us understanding all the things I told you about, that we still are not as open as we should be and non-judgmental. That we talk about cultural relativity, but how judgmental are we about people who are different and who think differently than we are? So the idea of humility, yes, we can become competent, but are we humble as people who are engaging with others? The idea of cultural intelligence is interesting because it talks about um, not only understanding what is different about the environment you're in, but to be able to function in that environment and then to be able to switch and to function um, in, a in a different um, environment. <clears throat> There's also a need to uh, take cultural competence to a different a level so that in our educational programs, we're integrating the need for an understanding of systemic inequalities in uh, the larger society. So say you're looking at a particular scientific problem. How did it get to be that way? And what's happening in larger society that is impacting on the way people are responding to, to this issue? For example, um, vaccine resistance in this country. It's not just about getting you know, getting more people in your group or in your sample to get vaccines, it's also looking at how did it get to be that way? And, and what are the factors that you have to understand in order to figure out where those levers of change are? Power imbalances in our country and in other countries, other places we're looking at. What is the impact of racism and homophobia and misogyny in terms of our cultural competence education. These are systemic uh, inequalities that permeate the larger society that we're gonna have to understand if we're going to be effective in the environments in which we work. And finally, because so many of you are interested in working in other parts of the world, global cultural competence, competence is imperative for uh, this international work. And <clears throat> I think it takes it will take a different, a more enhanced kind of, of concept of cultural competence uh, to, to do this work. Clearly language training is a part of it. Living in other cultures is, is definitely a part of it. Being an anthropologist has given me a, a really important background and way to do this, but everybody's not an, an anthropologist. So I'm just saying that global cultural competence is another layer of work that has to be done in order to, to, to um, become competent in the global environment. <clears throat> so, in summary, I would say that systems, systemic cross-cultural understanding is an ongoing process. And that's how you have to think about it. It's not a one-off, it's not a workshop. It's, it's a lifelong kind of commitment. Once you commit yourself to it, it has the potential though to change yourself, but to also provide authentic organizational transformation. And here are some references, and I thank you for my short 25 minute presentation. <laughs> thank you so much. Really wonderful, especially, I was thinking a lot about the measuring concept and the yes. sponsorship concept. But yeah, I wanna open up the floor for any quick 
questions um, that you want to ask. Or comments, not or just questions. questions. Yeah, because yeah, I, when I was listening, I could jump in real fast. The sponsorship, uh, when you talked about sponsorship, I thought it was really compelling because it, it reminded me about when I was in university, um, you know, UChicago is kind of this, this bubble of, you know, itself being around Hyde Park. And one of the things I felt like was always a burning question whenever I was eventually staff, you know, from students to staff was, was why don't we bring in um, more residents from Hyde Park into the campus. I feel like that would be more disruptive than like going out and being like, here's a science program, uh, because I really wanted to see that. But yeah, uh, Sasha, go ahead. Hello, uh, Dr. Moses, thank you so much for this presentation. Oh, you're Sorry. welcome. Um, and I, I'm a UCR alum, so hello. <laughs> you are? What year did you graduate and what department? Uh, 2016 from EEOB. EEOB. Evolutionary and Organismal Biology. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of campus. Um, but um, <clears throat> my question is, um, I work for a small nonprofit organization uh, right now, and we only have about four to five team members. Oh. And I'm wondering if you have any like um, suggestions that, that as a leader that I could help with um, any persons on my team that might be uh, BIPOC or, you know, uh, different culturally than the rest of the team. Um, like, how can I help guide or how can I help the team kind of be more open and culturally competent in that space? Do you feel that they aren't at this point? Um, I think, I think everyone is willing and wants to be, um, welcoming and has, is thinking about that, but sometimes things come out, you know, that maybe microaggressions that we're not aware of. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how do I support team members that might be experiencing those? Well, you know, I always think about, I always tie my, how do I say this? I always tie the goals of cultural competence with the goals of the organization. So what is your mission statement? What does it say? And if everybody is expected to be their best selves in carrying out that mission, one of the things you can ask is, um, what is getting, what would stand in the way of you doing that? How? how can you, how can we as an organization help you, help us achieve that? And if it has to do with um, recognizing differences or putting systems in place where people can check other people who may be doing something that is <laughs> making them feel uncomfortable, then it should be a part of a larger system that is not just focused on one individual, but it's focused on the, ex the, the excellence of the organization and things that get in the way of you doing that organizational work in the way that you say you want to do it. And then I would let them tell you as a leader what it is that bugs them, <laughs> bothers them, or is, is doing that. And you figure out ways, maybe some things you would have to do, but other ways they could do it collectively, of putting in, in place procedures where people don't, people can say, I that was not appropriate, and here's why. And then it's not a, oh, I'm a bad person because I did this, but what's going to make us all better? What's going to make us work together? How can we actually create uh, a team out of all this diversity? It's about inclusion, right? Diversity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to be systemic. It can't be just put on one individual to do that, which is why the leadership is so important. You know, the fact that you recognize it means that you want to do something about it. 
Oh, really, thank you so much. That was great. Oh, I, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I think that really, that's a really good point is not to put the onus on the one person and make them feel othered any further and just really recognize that it's the whole team that needs to change. Yeah, I mean, everybody has to support everybody, but in order to do that, what do you need to learn? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes that. Um, otherwise it does, you know, stay at that individual level, but it has to be larger than that. Absolutely, thank you so much. You're welcome. Wonderful. Anyone else? Any other quick comments or questions? Okay. No, really great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Moses. Um, oh, you're welcome. So many memories of working in academia in my head, uh, remembering mission statements uh, and, uh, you know, all those questions back then. So it was really great uh, listening to this. Um, Right. Um, next is going to be uh, Bishva, and we'll let Lauren uh, take on the lead for this. But um, yeah, please stick around because this will be more discussion based. Oh, and quick question. Go ahead. Yeah, I had just got a quick question um, for Dr. Moses. Uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, want to you to kind of expand on that idea of like building in accountability at 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 step like what um what advice would you give um in terms of like defining uh accountability metrics and what kind of metrics are probably useful but then i could imagine there are metrics that probably are are not that great to incorporate so if you could expand on that a bit okay well uh I think that there should be um, a variety of ways that you can be held accountable. And some of that depends on what your job is and your job description. So the idea would be, um, to what extent are you, does um, your commitment to uh, cultural competence enhance the work that you've been doing over the last year? And if you are the financial officer, if you're a field officer, if you're a researcher, in your job description and the way that you're evaluated, if, if uh, a commitment to cultural competence and um, metrics that measure that, that could be done in maybe, yes, attending workshops, but yes, maybe mentoring someone, um, yes, maybe um, sharing information that perhaps people in the organization doesn't know, uh, people in the organization don't know about. Um, I, it's, it's like the, the metrics have to be connected to the work that is being done. They can't be separate and apart over there because they're so easy to lop off if they are. And so it may take a little bit of time to, to sit and think about it. For me, it was easier because it was, it, was de it, were, it was the deans that ultimately we put how many, I mean, we were able to measure, how many diverse faculty did you hire last year? And if you didn't, why not? So that it was like, well, you know, there's hard to find. They're hard to find. I couldn't find any. Or, you know, I, there are all kinds of excuses. And some of them were legitimate, but some of them were not. And you don't want it to be punitive, punitive, but you want people to know you're paying attention to this. This is not a throwaway. This is something that our organization believes in. And because we believe in it, we're going to measure it. And if we measure it, that means we're going to put some resources toward it. And we want to know if those resources are, are, are actually uh, being used wisely for the work that we're doing, or the time is being used wisely. 
So there has to be a variety of ways that the individuals can fulfill this commitment. And, so, and it would have to do with the work that they're doing. And other than that, I can't, I mean, if I knew exactly the organization and what was going on in the organization, then I could maybe come up with some more concrete examples. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is a young professional from the diplomacy workforce. So Vishva Bhatt uh, works at the Meridian International Center, um, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit diplomacy center in Washington, DC, that promotes greater understanding and collaboration between the United States and the world. Um, so at Meridian, Vishva works as a senior diplomatic engagement associate. Uh, where she is passionate about international peace and security and is committed to helping create a better world through diplomacy and problem solving. She graduated from the George Washington University with a Bachelor of Arts in International Affairs with concentrations in security policy and international environmental studies, um, as well as a minor in Arabic studies. Vishva is also fluent in Gujarati, Spanish, and Arabic, um, which I'm sure helps with cross-cultural interactions. Very cool. Um, and she currently lives in Washington, D.C. So uh, today, Vishva is going to speak about her experiences as a young professional in the diplomacy space, um, specifically regarding um, her own experiences using and developing cross-cultural competency skills in her work at Meridian. So thank you for being here today, Vishva. The floor is all yours. Thanks, Lauren, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Moses, for your presentation. It was very informative, um, and I learned a lot. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, I'm an early career professional, which means I'm still learning every day. Um, Dr. Moses is an expert, as you all saw. Um, I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I'm someone who has recently begun using cross-cultural communication on a regular basis um, and is applying it to my work every day. Um, today, I'm going to share my experiences in international affairs, what I've learned so far, and what I think are some important skills to really work and succeed in the field and in cross-cultural communication. Um, but I'm excited to also listen to what you all have to say and your experiences and what you bring to the table as well. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I'm a Senior Diplomatic Engagement Associate at Meridian. It's a pretty cool title, but I get asked all the time, what does it actually mean? What do you actually do? Um, and it's a good question, but the key words there are diplomatic engagement, um, which means my work is largely focused around engaging with the foreign diplomatic corps, so diplomats from other countries that come to the U.S., uh, my role kind of entails creating programming that helps diplomats more successfully um, do their job in the U.S. Um, and in my opinion, um, more importantly, or most importantly, brings together diplomats with the public and private sector leaders, U.S. government leaders, um, nonprofits, think tanks, uh, everything you can imagine, and allows them to build relationships with one another. Uh, diplomacy is, after all, about people. It's about the relationships between countries, yes, but it's the people from those countries that build and maintain uh, those relationships. And so um, at Meridian, we're a convenings organization. We bring people together to engage in that relationship building that is so central to diplomacy. So in the diplomatic corps, we work with everyone from consular offices or consular officers on their first assignment to ranking ambassadors who are many times the most senior officials outside of their country. In fact, many ambassadors to the U.S. previously served as the foreign ministers or the equivalent to the secretary of state in their home countries, and some of them are even former prime ministers or presidents, like the current Australian ambassador to the U.S., um, His Excellency Kevin Rudd. He was formerly the prime minister of Australia, so it's pretty cool um, that these ambassadors are now representing their countries in the U.S. Um, we also engage government officials, including top officials at the White House and the State Department. We also engage the public sector, so leaders, like I said, from think tanks or international organizations like the IMF um, and the private sector as well. So all of these parties, all of these groups have different work cultures and protocols, right? For example, um, many of you have a science background. When you walk into a lab, you know, you know what the proper protocols are, what to wear, how to talk about things. For me, I don't have that same background. All I know is that you probably wear a lab, lab coat. Um, for my chemistry class, I learned to wear closed-toed shoes, but I really wouldn't know any of the names for the equipment or the right, you know, protocol to approach it. 
Um, so in the world of diplomacy, those those same rules are, you know, applicable. There's written rules and unwritten rules that govern how you behave and interact with others. Um, but I want to hear a little bit from you as well. So what's something that you would say is something in science that would be different from diplomacy? Maybe there's a protocol or a practice or a language that you would use. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and join in. I guess I can start. Uh, I would say from my perspective, it feels like there's Oftentimes, scientific labs focus on much more specific topics than I would imagine diplomacy does. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of get siloed into your research area, and basically everyone around you likes to talk about very similar things. <laughs> um, so that means uh, much more narrow focuses, much a lot more acronyms, a lot more jargon, uh, as Mary just put in the chat. I'd say that's my personal experience, at least. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I would agree. I think you have a lot of knowledge um, about many things, but definitely when you focus in on a specific topic, you know, you get that specialized focus. Abigail, I see you're unmuted as well. Um, hi, I did mean to unmute. Um, uh, I guess like some of the language, yeah, I mean, besides acronyms, though, I, I listened to this talk and they said, okay, scientists use significant in one way, but maybe a lay audience doesn't use significant in the, in the same way. So like certain verbiage and certain language that might not translate exactly to diplomacy. And then the other thing that I would consider, and maybe this is my own experience, but I don't do a lot of maybe negotiating um, in my like PhD. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, usually a very clear path forward. Um, so I'm not, you know, working very hard to convince someone of something, especially if the data doesn't support uh, or if the data just isn't sufficient to make an argument. Yeah, that's helpful as well. Thank you, Abigail. Um, I think that all of that is very true. I think, and myself, I consider myself a generalist. Um, yes, I focused in those things Lauren mentioned, but um, I am not an expert in one topic area, as many diplomats um, are not, or I would say some of them are, you know, if you're an economic officer, or political officer, you're more specialized, but you have to know about countries all over the world, right? You have to be updated on many different things. And so you may not have that deep dive into one specific area or region, unless you're focused in that. Um, you may have to know a lot more broadly uh, the information that, you know, you have to maintain that reserve of. Um, so working in international affairs, cross-cultural communication is embedded in everything that we do, whether it's, you know, writing an invitation that we know needs to be clear and understandable from for diplomats from all different countries where English may not be their first language. Um, we also want to keep in mind cultural sensitivities and protocol when emailing ambassadors um, or simply the way I welcome someone to an event, right? If it's an ambassador, I'm not going to call them by their first name unless I know them like that. I'm gonna say, welcome your excellency. Um, and when I introduce them, I'm gonna say his excellency, her excellency, or the honorable, right? These are some of the things that we do to show respect and um, respect for their position, despite regardless of where they're from. Um, but this is a learned skill and, you know, working in the field, I've learned that from my peers, but I wasn't necessarily taught that in school, even though I studied, you know, international affairs. So it's something that you really learn on the job um, and touches on protocol as well, which is a different topic. Um, but if you're interested, you can look up the protocol manual from the US and there's a lot of good information there as well. Um, so, you know, Cross-cultural communication is a part of everything we do in diplomacy. Um, in fact, cross-cultural communication is already a part of many of our daily lives. Um, raise your hand if you work or go to school with someone from a different cultural background. Yeah, I think everyone would probably have their hand raised. Um, we all are from different cultural backgrounds. So we interact with people from different culturals, cultures regularly. Um, and in the US, especially, we have a really heterogeneous population, right? We're interacting with people from various cultural backgrounds on a daily basis. Um, and so we are already practicing cross-cultural collaboration and communication. Um, of course, it's a little bit different when you're working with individuals from different countries on a daily basis. But at the same time, you know, you got to remember everyone is... Um, human. They are all trying their best. Everyone has their own biases, preconceptions, and beliefs, but um, in diplomacy, everyone comes in with this idea that 
we will all try to understand one another, you know, build relationships, find commonalities, um, and bridge the gap between one another. So I want to do another quick exercise. Um, let's say a colleague or classmate invites you to their house one day. When you arrive, they ask you, do you want some water, some coffee, some tea? Um, how many of you would say yes the first time they asked you? You could just raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, I see some hands raised. I don't see everyone's hands raised, though. Um, me, myself, I would definitely say yes the first time someone offered it to me because in my culture, the way I was raised, it's disrespectful to say no when you go to someone's house and they offer you something to drink, right? But not everyone shares that same value. Some people don't see it as, um, you know, insensitive or uncultural or, you know, they don't see any issue with saying no. And I, that's totally understandable. I'm not saying it's right one way or another, but that's a cultural difference that we may not think about um, until we're actually thinking about it and forced to think about it through a critical lens. So things like that. Um, cultures have little things that have differences and we all have our own different backgrounds that we grew up it grew up with. Um, you know, you might call your friend's parents by their first name. Um, I would personally not call my parents or my friend's parents by their first name because Indian culture, for example, has a strong emphasis on your elders, um, respecting your elders. And so that's something that I would not do, at least the way I was you know, raised, even though I was raised here in the US. So it's interesting to think about your own biases. As uh, Dr. Moses mentioned, we gotta be um, looking at ourselves as well and thinking about what we're bringing to the table and what uh, biases we're coming in with. Um, like many things in diplomacy, cross-cultural communication is a soft skill. It can't be memorized, right? It, but it can be practiced. And with practice, you get more comfortable and confident in your skills. Um, but how do you practice the skill? Um, I'd say two main things, literature and lived experiences, right? Graduating from school in international affairs doesn't mean you're culturally competent. Um, you have to do more to educate yourself. So read literature on international affairs, on race, on diversity, on inclusion, on equity, and read it with a critical eye because many of the early literature, especially in diplomacy, was exclusionary to people of color, to women, to other minorities. Um, and so view it from a critical lens and think about how things have changed, what could be included, what could be changed from the way it was written. Um, also keep up with the news, what world events are happening, right? I don't, uh, recently um, in the news, Ukraine has been a big um, story, right? And so if I was meeting with a delegation from Ukraine or the Ukrainian ambassador, I would keep that in the back of my mind because that's important. Um, that's something that's on their mind. And I wouldn't want to necessarily say something insensitive or make a joke, right? Because this is a very real situation for them. And things like that are important, even though you may not think they are. Um, also, are there any cultural holidays being celebrated, right? Going back to the example of someone offering water at their house, right now it's Ramadan and many people across the world are observing it. As a host, if you know that someone is observing Ramadan, it might be the culturally sensitive thing to not offer them water or food if you know that they're observing it or practicing it, right? So things like that, learning about different cultures, traditions, practices, and preferences, it'll make you more apt at communicating with people from all different backgrounds in the US and abroad. Um, and then I mentioned liter literature, but you can also learn cross-cultural collaboration and communication through lived experiences. My identity and experiences as a woman of color um, impact both how I am communicating and also how I am being communicated to. Um, I'm inherently more aware of some of these cultural differences as I grew up, um, you know, with South Asian culture in my house. But I also had a foot in American culture. I was born in the U.S. I was raised in the U.S. And so I have a, a background that lets me view the world in a different way than maybe one of my peers or some of my peers. Um, and also as a woman of color in international affairs, which is, to be completely honest, not a super diverse field, um, I also face some challenges because some people um, from the US and abroad don't take women as seriously. Um, some people don't take brown women as seriously. Um, and I, I, 
I have been on the receiving end of this type of judgment during my short career. I've only been in the professional workforce for a little more than a year, and I've already experienced some of these challenges, right? And so it's not something that people just talk about. It's lived experiences, and I can speak to it myself. Um, so ultimately, your lived experiences also contribute to your understanding of cross-cultural communication um, in addition to the literature that you're reading and the information you're consuming. Um, the most important skill I would say here is being able to communicate effectively and efficiently, but being able to do it respectfully and empathetically. Um, it is always better, in my opinion, to be more respectful than less. As a default, I will always give someone the highest level of respect, regardless of their rank or their position. Um, so if I didn't know someone was an ambassador or not, I would rather refer to them as the honorable instead of being mistaken for the opposite, right? That's just something in my work that I encounter, but I wouldn't, like I said, call them by their first name um, if I wasn't sure. And if I'm wrong and they're not an ambassador, I don't think they'll be offended by being called the honorable, right? It's a sign of respect. And so that's something that I do in my personal life. This was not taught to me, but it's something I adopt. And I think it's interesting to think about. Um, but most of all, be, be open to learning. As Dr. Moses said, keep an open mind and continue to develop your skills and learn from others and put yourselves in other shoes and try and understand where they're coming from. This is something that I am actively doing and I'm actively learning every day. I try to learn you know, one new fact about a different culture or a different country um, and hold myself accountable when I can to continuing to educate myself. And finally, I would say practice. Don't be afraid to network. Don't be afraid um, to speak to someone like Dr. Moses mentioned. I know sometimes it's scary if you don't know what to say. I still get nervous networking sometimes because I'm not sure what to say, but the more I do it, the more comfortable and confident I become and the more competent I feel in my communication skills. Um, I know it's eight and I'm sorry for going a little bit all the way to the mark, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Vishva. Um, yeah, just being mindful of the time, I know it's eight in Eastern time. Um, so if anyone needs to go, then feel free. But as long as Vishva is um, available to stay, we would love to have you stay and answer a couple questions. Um, I know Dr. Moses raised your hand, so go ahead. Yes, I wanted to know if you plan to become a diplomat. I'm not sure, to be completely honest with you. Maybe, maybe not. When I, inter when I entered international affairs, I didn't really know what it was, and so I thought the only career path was being a diplomat or being part of the United Nations. Of course, that's not true. There's many career paths, um, but we'll see. I'll let you know when I, when I figure okay. it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting. Hi, Vishva. Um, that was great. Thank you. Uh, I did have one quick, quick question about your personal experiences, but how do you pursue like training in your day to day or in your, your work experiences? Yeah. So do you mean training like cross cultural communication? Yeah. Skills? Yeah. Or is it just something that you're, you know, gaining during your, your working experiences? I would say a little bit of both. One, just the practice of it. But two, you know, when I started, I didn't really know exactly the right type of language to use in an email back to a diplomat. And so I had, um, I have a team of course. And so I would send that to some member of my team to ask them for feedback on it. What do you think you've experienced this? You've worked with diplomats before. Is this language right? How can I change it? Um, and I still try and do that, you know, when I'm unsure of something, just to get a second opinion, second thought, and a different perspective from my own. Um, and I do the same thing, you know, when we're publishing something about a program we had, we try and get two sets of eyes on it because everyone has a different perspective. And we want to make sure we're getting a second, you know, point of view when we can. Um, and then I would say just through the work, you know, when you're interacting with diplomats and ambassadors at events, in person, um, emailing them, you do get practice, like I said, just engaging in cross-cultural communication. 
Um, I would also say, I, you know, something I really enjoy is meeting people from different backgrounds and cultures and learning about them. So I'm never shy to ask a question about something I don't know or admit I don't know something um, and see what someone's experiences are uh, because it provides me an opportunity to learn. And 99% of the time, people are happy to share, you know, their lived experiences um, and talk about, you know, their culture. Um, hi, Vishpa. Um, I kind of had a follow up to that. I think um, a lot of um, cultures uh, I can speak to, uh, um, like, ma like, as an Indian culture, people feel like it's, it's considered uh, disrespectful to maybe ask questions to somebody who's an adult, right? uh out of respect so in those cases if you are in doubt like how do you um navigate that situation to kind of be cognizant that the other person might feel disrespectful for it but it's it's also important so you don't maybe um hurt them a bit more than than you would have intended to yeah so i'll i'll mention a few things there one um for example we work with um, not me personally, but others at Meridian work with exchange students and leaders that come from other countries on exchange programs. And something that they uh, were sharing with me recently that I hadn't even thought about was in some cultures, you don't shake hands, right? Or women don't shake hands with men. Um, and like I mentioned, I grew up here in the US and I had one foot in Indian culture, but also one foot in American culture. I never think twice about shaking someone's hand. Now, once that was mentioned to me, you know, I do think twice about it because I want to be respectful of their culture. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. And so something they suggested was trying to put your hand on your heart first. And then if they go for a handshake, you know, reciprocating that. Um, but that was something that I just learned very recently, two weeks ago, maybe. Um, and so, like I said, constantly learning. Um, but something like that, it's always better to be more respectful, right? If you put your hand on their heart and they go for a handshake, then you can go for a handshake. But if you put your hand on their heart, on your heart and they match that, okay, that's fine. Maybe they don't want to shake hands, but they're not feeling like you're not acknowledging them, right? You're still showing that you're acknowledging them and a sign of respect. Um, and so specifically for the Indian culture with uh, your elders example, I think it goes back to being the most respectful you can be but also keeping in mind, you know, when you're working with diplomats in the foreign diplomatic corps, they're diplomats. They know that they're working with people from different cultures. They're masters of cross-cultural communication. Um, and they know that American culture, that Indian culture, that all these different cultures are different. Um, and they are also doing the same thing we're doing. And that's trying to be empathetic and understanding of different cultures. Um, if you have to ask someone a question that's, you know, about what time they're going to join you for the program, they're going to understand, um, even if they're your elder. But if you want to ask them a super personal question, like about their family or something you think they might be uncomfortable with, you can try speaking to them first and seeing, you know, how they are engaging in that conversation. That's something I do. Just, you know, how are you today? That's not disrespectful to ask, um, at least in my experience, no one. But if they're standoffish, right, and they're not, you know, engaging in that conversation, you can kind of get a feel, okay, maybe they're not in the mood to chat today, or maybe they don't want to have this conversation right now and go from there. Um, but I think leading with respect is the biggest thing and empathy, um, but also just staying true to yourself. If you want to speak to them, um, like I said, they're diplomats and they're ambassadors and they understand that they're working with people from different cultures. So I would just say lead with respect, but also just be empathetic and understanding when you can be. Does that answer your question? Anastasia, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I love the, the point you make about you're in this kind of environment that's full of masters of cultural competency. Um, whereas like Dr. Moses is coming in from, you know, what can we do to build capacity for cultural competency? What do you think about, you know, because you work in a situation where cultural competency, cultural competency is part of your job. Like, do you think there's value in collaborating, like the, having the Meridian collaborate with other institutions to kind of show like, 
yes, this is a very possible and everyday thing. And this is how we measure it and do it every day. And it's part of our job. Yeah, so um, yes, and yes, but I'll say you that. I'll say yes, Meridian does work to work with other organizations to show the value of engaging with the foreign diplomatic corps, right? That's something we do on a regular basis. But as an institution, as a nonprofit based in the US, based in Washington, DC, we are also working to improve our DEI or EDI is what we call it at Meridian Equity, Diversity and Inclusion internally. Because at the end of the day, like I mentioned, international affairs, and this is my own personal you know, opinion, is not a very diverse American international affairs is not very diverse and inclusive. Um, it is becoming more so, but for, you know, generations, it has not been. It's been predominantly dominated by um, straight white men. And so it's difficult for many different people, not from those backgrounds, to break into it. Um, and so within institutions doing foreign policy work, there is still that challenge of improving cultural competency and understanding within, right? We might be experts at talking to diplomats, but at the end of the day, if you're being disrespectful to a person of color within your organization, and I'm not saying this is happening, but if you are, that's still something that can be improved. Um, the State Department, I believe last year, maybe the year before that, um, just instituted a chief diversity equity and inclusion officer, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley, um, and Dr. Moses touched upon, you know, roles like that briefly, and you can refer back to her comments on that to see some of the challenges that come with that. Um, but even within the State Department, the U.S.'s biggest foreign policy organization, um, they are working and still facing that challenge of how do you best include and communicate across different cultures within the organization, right? Um, so that's why I say yes, but uh, if that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I also saw in the chat um, that Ella asked about resources to learn and expose your, you to other cultures. I would say culture is all around you if you try and make an effort to really learn about it. Um, something I have been trying to do more of is watch movies from different countries. Um, yes, it's a little bit harder if you don't speak the language, but subtitles are great now. Almost everything has subtitles. Um, so that's a, been a way for me to learn a little bit about different cultures. But in addition to, you know, reading the news and looking that stuff up, I like to see what holidays are coming up. Um, so Easter is coming up, you know, Passover was last night, um, those sorts of things. And if I don't know what Passover is, if I don't know what Easter is, taking five minutes, 10 minutes out of my day to read about it, to learn about it. So when I do have a conversation with someone that's celebrating these holidays, even if I don't celebrate them myself, I'm able to, you know, engage with them and have a thoughtful conversation. Um, I would also say other resources, you know, there's tons of literature, and I'm sure Dr. Moses would be a better reference for you than me on exactly what literature to reference, um, but there's lots of thought literature on cross-cultural cultural communication, um, and I'd also go back to what I was saying about protocol. There's a protocol manual, I think it's written by Robert Hickey, I want to say, um, but that talks about protocol when you engage with different cultures, like when you have two ambassadors coming in and a speaker, how do you seat them, right? What's the dining arrangement? Where do you stand someone when they're uh, standing for a picture or what's the official title you use? Things like that, that are more um, niche, I would say to diplomacy, but if you're interested, you can definitely check that out. Great, thank you so much, Vishva. I think that is a good place to stop for the evening, especially because we're a bit past time. Um, but thank you for sharing your time with us today, both you and Dr. Moses. This has been really wonderful. Um, and I think everyone learned a lot. Um, so yeah, it was wonderful to welcome you uh, to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be here.
Good night. Thank you. Have a great night. Night, everyone.